Welcome to Revolutionize Your Marketing, Your Business, Your Life. And we are here today with Chris King, and we're going to talk about the brain today. We're going to get into the neuroscience of why you're so nutty and crazy. No. Um, <laughs> well, we are a little, little bit, um, but I won't steal your thunder, Chris. Why don't you tell my audience a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yeah, thank you so much, and thank you for having me. You know, the title of your podcast is really perfect for us. Um, you know, our, our organization was built to make seemingly impossible things happen as quickly as we can, and um, and the seemingly impossible shows up in any number of ways for whether it's an, an organization or a team within an organization that might have some new project, new initiative, something that, you know, even they aren't sure that they can pull off and don't know how. Uh, or it can be an individual that's looking at how do I completely reinvent my life or my relationship or career change or, you know, how do I get my 26 year old out of my basement? You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> thank God I don't have that problem. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's a challenge. It's a challenge. Yeah. Plus every parent out there that does. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a, a thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I, so we were talking, you know, a little bit before we got started, and I think it's interesting how you explain the way you're splitting up your business. You've got the B2B side and the B2C side, and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm fascinated on, like, what, what's the difference and why you, you know, can split your business that way? Yeah, the, the, well, it's the brand that I was having such a, such a challenge with, and I thought, well, you know, being an entrepreneur, it's a struggle to one business. Let's try and run two, you know, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go the other way. <laughs> right. Um, but but the you know, brand is is really how the client experiences you, your your product or your work. And on the B2B side, it's wildly different on, than on the B2C side. And what I say is the B2B side, it's very practical. It's very strategic. There's a lot of it's scalable because it's all science backed on the on the B2C side. Well, that's kind of where the magic happens. And so that's much more intuitive and ethereal and conceptual. And so it just depends on, you know, what is it that that the client is looking for and what is going to best serve their needs? Got it. OK, makes sense. Well, most of my clients are on the B2B side, so I think we'll mm -hmm. play on that part of your business, if that's okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about how you're using neuroscience and um, your um, education with, you know, people's brains, mm -hmm. with lack of better words to put out. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I sort of got an accidental education in neurobiology. I was, I was working in the Neuroscience Institute of the hospital for a while, and that was part of it. And I did a lot of training with uh, the Flow Research Collective, the Flow Genome Project. I still, to this day, I, I train with retired U.S. Navy SEALs and Army Special Forces, and because they're all about making, you know, seemingly impossible things a reality. And, and it's a function of getting your psychology, your physiology, and your energy all working for you instead of against you. And when you do this correctly, when you sort of calibrate what I call these human systems or these teams, you know, because everything is a system. If you can calibrate this system, um, you can produce what is known as flow states, what athletes call being in the zone or runner's high. It's all driven by neurochemistry. So if you can set the conditions and behaviors in an organization, you can get them into, quote unquote, the zone. And this is where we get exponential increases in speed, in creativity. We eliminate stress levels. This is how we make impossible things a reality. Okay. Well, I think everybody wants wants that right to be mm -hmm. optimizing and efficiency how do you even start down that path with a client well it, i'm gonna sound like an attorney here it depends right <laughs> <laughs> It depends on what it is they're trying to do. Um, you know, like we, my organization doesn't deal too much with really dysfunctional teams or things that are falling apart or serious culture problems, petty tyrants, narcissists, that kind of thing. We oh, are so much fun. It's so much fun. I just, yeah, I decided I didn't want to do I like to be the only, you know, difficult person in the room. So, uh, <laughs> but, um, right. <laughs> so, um, but it is understanding, you know, what it's, it's more about what does this team need to stop doing more than it is what they need to start doing. There's a great story about, um, Michelangelo creating the statue of David. And the story goes that when he was done, they asked him, how did you create David out of this giant chunk of stone? And Michelangelo said, I didn't create David. David was already in there. I just had to remove the stuff that wasn't him. And so that's what we're doing because flow, getting into the zone, is a natural state for humans. And so if we can remove all of the things that are in their way, well, we can make them a whole lot quicker and a lot, uh, and a lot more creative. 
Yeah. So maybe, so you said with B2B, we want to be more practical. Maybe mm -hmm. kind of make it more practical. I don't want to say, I hate using dumb and down, but like flow seems like this fluffy kind of woo woo idea. How do I apply that to my team? Yeah, well, I mean, we can we can talk about transient hypofrontality or something, but then I, you know, I'm just gonna lose everything. <laughs> so, you know, we call it flow. It's, what are you um, doing to me, Chris? <laughs> I know, right? So the um, it, essentially, flow is a tool. I mean, that's that's really what it is. Getting somebody into the zone is a tool that can be used to achieve company goals, to make the team a lot faster, to make them work together better, increase efficiency, productivity. And really, I'm, I'm not much for efficiency or productivity. I'm more, it's more about leverage, right? Because anybody can teach you time management skills. But right. improving your input to output ratio, like I'll go into an organization, I'll tell you, how would you like to get three weeks of work done this week? I can make that happen. Yeah. Right. You know, I'll take an executive, right? Yeah, the executives working 60 hours a week, I'll cut that person down to about 32 hours a week and they will get three to five times more done that week and they'll be a lot happier doing it. Oh gosh, I mean, how, how do you do that? Well, you mean in terms of the tools and everything? I mean, it's yeah, like I mean, not to give away your secret sauce, but like I'm executive, I'm working those crazy hours. I've, you know, getting, I'll be truly honest, like getting kind of that burnt out phase. Yeah. Like how do you come in and help someone like me? It's well, I'm, I'm going to physiologically change the way your brain is functioning and I'm, okay. and I'm going to punch a hole in a quantum wall and alter and alter time. So like it, most people, I tell you, they'll, they'll, in order to get more done, what do they do? They work more hours. Well, yeah. that is the hamster wheel. Yep. And and this requires a lot of counterintuitive behaviors. If you want to get more done, like a lot more done, you don't increase the number of hours, you reduce the number of hours. And and there's two things that I that I can illustrate. One is think about the last time you went on vacation. Let's say you were, you know, getting on a plane on Friday and you were going to be gone for 2 weeks. How much work did you get done and wrap up in Monday through Thursday that week? Three weeks worth of work got done, right? Just yeah. like things got buttoned up, tied up, locked down. And, and yeah. that's exactly what I'm talking about. And so a okay. simple tool is you start every Monday, like you are leaving on Friday for two weeks. Watch how much you'll get done. Interesting. Okay. But I feel like I'm going to do some crazy hours though. And I'm cramming everything in. Is that... That's well, it's linear thinking because this requires a lot of counterintuitive behavior for every hour for, for, for every three hours that you work over 40 hours in a week, you're only getting about one hour of actual work product. It's what I call getting really bad gas mileage. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're working three hours and only getting one hour juice out of it, that's not good. Right. So if, if you do the counterintuitive thing, if you tighten up where you're allowed to budget your time. And you start understanding how to prioritize things and you even start challenging everything in your business that you think has to be the way that it is. Um, and, and this is a function of neuroscience. People will create, validate, and recreate the reality of your understanding. And so if you can challenge what you think is real, we can make the thing that you don't think is possible a reality. And this is proven through science and it's through, there's something called the Bannister principle, if you're familiar with that. Um, it's it's the, the four minute mile guy. Uh, some people know oh, this yeah, story, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the four minute mile guy. It was, it was impossible for decades until he, uh, Roger Bannister in May of 1954 run, ran a sub four minute mile. After decades of people trying to do this, his record only lasted 46 days. Oh. Because people changed what they believed. They, they understood this was now possible, and now that's the new reality they can create. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's true because you see it in the Olympics, right? You've got mm -hmm. the best of the best, and every year someone's breaking a record, doing it better, yeah, differently. So, um, yeah, interesting, interesting. I just, I guess I'm still hooked on the 60 hours a week to 32 hours a week. And how you do I have a client right now and I'll tell you, it's, it's really interesting because on, on the B2C side, 80% of our clients have been professional executive women on some, some level. Okay. Um, and so, and, and I found that fascinating, but the, um, but we took one, she has an HR consulting company. She, she wanted to take her six figure business to a seven figure business. 
She wanted to work no more than 32 hours a week. She said that she wanted to be a digital nomad so she could travel all over the place whenever she wanted. And then she half jokingly said she'd like to someday find the man that she's going to marry. We got all that done in nine months. That, oh God, that's so crazy to me. I just don't get it. Like, I guess my linear thinking can't, is stuck. Yeah, yeah. I just can't imagine that. Well, ta tasks have an interesting way of expanding or contracting based on what you think. Like if I said something like, you know, how long would it take you to write a book? If you think the answer is six months, it'll be six months. If you th think the answer is 18 months, it'll be 18 months. If you think it's six weeks, you're going to be right. Um, you know, okay. because wh whatever you think, that's what you're going to produce. So when I, when I go into an organization, I tell you, here's the first step is I need to make sure that I, I think I can actually work with this team if they're open enough for me to get in there. If they are, I'm not going to look at their KPIs, their sales history, their market trends or any of that stuff. I'm going to look at what is, the, what is the collective belief in this organization and how do I change this? Because if I can change what somebody thinks, I'm going to produce exponential increases in results way more than dealing with KPIs and market trends. Hmm, interesting. And I, I know you said you don't really work with like broken teams or difficult teams, but surely when you're working with a team, there's people that are gonna be resistant and pushing mm -hmm. back. Like how do you build that consensus and get them on board together? It's pretty rare that I have to deal with this um, because normally when I go in, I've, I've been asked to do something that they've never done before. And, and my process is very simple. What, what's the goal? What's my timeline? What are my resources? Now get out of my way. And that's just kind of the way I, I organize this is that you're going to have to let me do my job. And so we set up like Lockheed's has um, Lockheed Martin Corporation has the skunk works. And this is where all the really innovative stuff comes from. Well, they have built that organization around flow. And this is how they make these incredible leaps in technology and advancement. Um, so that's, that's essentially what we're doing is we're going to set up a little skunk works operation within somebody's company and we're going to operate, operate outside their normal hierarchy and we're going to make magic happen. The, the trick is they just have to leave us alone to do it. <laughs> yeah. Ah, oh, that's interesting. I actually have a couple of friends that are in skunk works. Um, cause so you get it right yeah, here in San Diego. I'll just mm -hmm. ask them about that. Like, do you guys get into flow? <laughs> oh yeah, that, that's how it was built. They, that's how they delivered the, the XP-80 shooting star was America's first jet fighter. Lockheed had 180 days to figure out how to build it because they didn't know and deliver that thing. They got it in 37 days ahead of schedule. Love it, amazing, amazing. So tell me, how does a team know or a business owner know it's time they need to come talk to you? Like, because this, although I've heard of it, I feel like most businesses and um, business owners tend to gravitate to the more traditional, um, right now what's very popular with my clients is EOS, the entrepreneur's operating mm -hmm. system, things that are more technically driven, like you said, how we manage, how do we set goals, those things mm -hmm. that we all learned in school, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and those are very effective tools. You know, I know a lot of people, EOS, and I've, I've actually talked to Gino. And, um, so, and, and so those are very effective systems. They're, um, most of these things are great for organization. They might be good for communication improvement. They might be good for dealing with you know, some level of dysfunction or friction within a team. Most of this stuff is not particularly good for innovation, and it's not necessarily great for speed. I mean, it might help. But it's not, it, it's not the nitrous oxide in the engine that, that something like flow can provide. It's just a wildly different thing. Got it. Okay. All right. And uh, so you gave us the example of the uh, professional or, or the HR. Um, she owned the HR company, correct? Yeah. Yeah. She was yeah. the owner of the business. Um, That's so great. And I went, so she found, found her significant other, found love. <laughs> yeah, she found love. <laughs> love she did. That. I mean, it's, it's going to sound a little woo here, but it was really about adjusting her frequency. And again, if I can literally change one word in a sentence and produce a different neurochemical charge in your brain, I can physiologically change the way your brain is functioning by changing one word in a sentence or reframing something in a certain way. And, and not only does it change yours, it changes mine, right? And so it's, this is what I mean. It's, you know, I'm just a systems hacker. You know, everything is a system, a, a business, a team, a person, they're all systems and any system can be hacked if you understand how that system works. Okay. Uh, do you have an example of what's a word or something you could change? 
Okay, so here's my little parlor trick. Because <laughs> this is great, because 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 somebody listening right now can can have an experience here. So if you think of something that you want, that you really want, now you're not going to tell me what it is, so make this count here. Um, okay. But you think of something that you want, and there's some kind of charge around not having it. So maybe there's frustration or anger or sadness or shame or something, but there's something there. Really connect with that and think to yourself with, with that experience, man, I just want that thing. Okay. Now stay connected to that thing you want, object, experience, whatever it is, and think, think it without the word just. I want that thing. Okay. What do you notice as the difference in your experience of those two sentences? Uh, I want that thing seems more like, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to get it. Whereas I just is like, I'm thinking about it. Okay. That- so one of them has more energy. It has more, um, I don't know if it's possibility. It feels more grounded or anchored, you know, however you're framing this, but it feels more real. Yeah. Well, what just happened, there was a subtle change in the way your brain was functioning. And this created a different experience in in your mind. Feelings drive actions and actions mm-hmm. produce results. And so just in that one example, by removing one word, I went from this kind of dreamy, wishy thing to an active desire and an, like a pursuit of it. And it right. and this is what's going to physiologically change your brain. It's going to make you take different actions, which is going to create different results. Just basic neuroscience. Oh, I love it. I love it. So I uh, use a methodology called Story Brand. I'm certified in it. And right. I, yeah, Donald Miller. And one of the things, and this is where I love your where you're where you're going and what you do is because people don't realize the emotions are so important. And when we take our clients through this framework, they push us back a little bit because they don't like the negative stakes part. Um, I or I call them positive or um not positive, but pain points, you know, Mm -hmm. what are your customer pain points? And we lean into those and we lead with those because that's the emotional hook. That's the emotional, Mm -hmm. you know, engagement that that customer wants, needs, Mm -hmm. right. To then Mm -hmm. go, okay, this brand, this company is for me. I'll go, I'll read more down their website. I'll Mm -hmm. learn about them. I'll, you know, take their brochure or whatever it is. And so I, that's why I love this because uh, in story brand and Donald, he talks a lot about that, mm-hmm. that people are emotional decision makers and you have yes. to really hit on that for them to want to engage and understand what you do, um, mm-hmm. and differentiate from your competition. So I truly yeah. believe all of this and yeah, right, yeah. That word makes a difference. Yeah. The, the part of my brain that understands what you do is not the part of my brain that dr- drives decisions. You know, it's the limbic system that drives decisions. And so, and, and that's an emotional engine. And so if, um, like I won't sell into pain, I absolutely won't do it ever. And this is why I'm a marketing person's worst nightmare. <laughs> like, the, like my, I, Marketing people hate me because I won't let them do most of the things they want to do. Selling into pain is one of them. It's like, here's your pain points. Here's your problems or whatever. This is very defeating. And, and it kind of comes this, yes, save me, rescue me thing. It's like, no, 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 no. Tell me what you really want. Let's get fired up and charged up about that because that's a completely different engine. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, and, and I get it, but as marketers, we have to do the things that work. Oh yeah, you gotta do the things that work. <laughs> gotta do the things that yeah. work. And for certain audiences, that's that's really correct. But for for an audience, then this is why I say I don't deal with like the super dysfunctional teams and the petty tyrants and the narcissists because I don't do rescue and I don't do saving. That's not my job. Yeah. My ju- my job is wow, that's incredible. Let's go chase after that. And it's just a different thing. And so okay. for us, it's really about the vision. And and even in in the the B two C clients, you know, I tell them, and I sound terribly insensitive. I said, number one, I'm going to interrupt you a lot because I don't care about your story. Like I just don't. I don't care what happened to you as a kid. And most of them are really relieved because they've been to therapy and they don't want to. They just don't want to hash it out again. I, I I know I sound terribly insensitive, and I just don't care because why you are here, you know, why you are the way you are. I don't care. I'm going to get you there. It doesn't matter how you got here. Right. No, and I love that. And I think obviously once somebody's in your program or working with you, that's when you make those, you know, kind of harder, um, I shouldn't say harder, but I can see why your methodology works. Cause right. I would probably be one of those people like, good, I don't want to talk about my childhood either. <laughs> I right. just want to figure out how to move forward. Um, so I love that. I love it. 
So Thank you're you. definitely a straight shooter. <laughs> yeah, well, I, that's why I said earlier, I like to be the only difficult person in the room because I'm just like, you're, you're just not paying me to be your friend. You're paying me to get you somewhere and, and you're doing and, and, and very quickly. I had a client that actually said to us, we got more out of working with you in three months than I got out of three years of therapy. <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right. I love that. Well, that's, that's amazing. That says a lot. Well, Chris, as we kind of wrap up here, I, this has been really good information. Uh, what would you say to my audience? Like what's something you could leave with them, like a tool or an action that they could take to get them moving forward? I would, that's such a, there's so many things. Um, I, I think the first thing is you have to challenge what you think you can't do. Like when you start thinking about what you really want, number one, it's probably rooted in what you think is possible or what you already have. So blow that away. What is it you really deeply want in your heart of hearts? And, and recognize that it, it is possible or even theorize. Just says, let's say just for whimsy's sake, what if it is possible? What might be a first step? Because when you start moving into that space, you're no longer contracted in all the reasons it can't happen. Now you're playing in the space of how it might be possible. And like I said, you will prove the reality of your understanding. And if you can start to move the needle a little bit on, hey, you know what? Maybe I can get closer to that. You're going to discover that you can. Yeah, that's great. And, I, you know, mindset is so powerful. I think the reality mm -hmm. is uh, <clears throat> most of us kind of know that. But you were been trained, like you said, we kind of that linear thinking. So I love that what you're doing and how you're doing it. If somebody in my audience did want to get a hold of you, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, check out our website, statusflow.net. That's our whole job. Take it from status quo to status flow. So statusflow.net is where you'll find us. Love it. Perfect. All right, Chris, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time. And um, yeah, I actually definitely want to connect with you after this and learn some more. <laughs> Anytime. Getting me to talk and, and is easy. Getting me to shut up is the trick. So. <laughs> <laughs>